Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. My name is Judy Cho and I'm board certified in holistic nutrition. And I have a private practice where we focus on root cause healing. And it often starts with the carnivore cures, all meat elimination diet. I had the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Sarah Zaldivar during the carnivore summit. And I wanted her to also join us on the nutrition with Judy channel. Sarah talks a lot about how, if we are not able to be successful on a carnivore diet or stick to a carnivore diet long-term, that it may be a component of addiction. She also challenges the thoughts about abstinence and moderation. It's a very interesting conversation. She talks about the importance of dopamine and how, while some of us on a carnivore diet don't exercise, why it's so important to exercise to replace some of the addiction or addictive components of food. Dr. Zaldivar has a PhD in exercise physiology and nutrition from the University of Miami, and she is a college professor and a licensed dietitian and a certified personal trainer. Dr. Zaldivar does one-on-one -on -one coaching as well as group coaching for addiction and just to get back to wellness. Dr. Zaldivar focuses on creating content on YouTube as well as Instagram to help others with a carnivore diet, mindset shifts, exercise, as well as dance. Dr. Zaldivar is such a fun person. And in this conversation, we talk about just the sobering realities of how to be successful on a carnivore diet and really just about how to be successful in life and whatever that means. A lot of times it really just comes down to doing the hard work and doing it day in and day out. This is such a fascinating conversation about framing our addictions to food and not being able to let go of certain foods and how it all relates to dopamine. Let's get right into the interview. Hi, Dr. Sarah. Thank you so much for joining me today. It is always fun to chat with you and we are just going to continue our conversation. I don't think I've ever had you on my actual channel, but I've interviewed you for the Carnivore Summit and people loved your interview and just the real talk you share about Carnivore. But for the people that may not have heard of you, if you can introduce yourself. Thank you so much, Judy. It is always a pleasure when we chat. I am a nutrition professor at Miami Dade College, and I'm also a carnivore, and I recommend the carnivore diet as the optimal human diet. And I've recently focused my work a lot on sugar addiction because I realize, and I know people don't like to hear it. Everybody's in denial. I did my dissertation on addiction and I still ate keto treats and I created YouTube recipes <laughs> about keto treats. So the denial is real. If someone like me who has looked at the papers and seen how much more addictive sweet taste is over cocaine and eventually over the studies came out, it was even far more addictive than heroin. If somebody left, like me can take decades before it clicks for them. Mm -hmm. So I, I understand why people think, oh, addiction doesn't relate to me. But all I would say is look around you, look at your history. How many times have you yo-yo dieted? Why is it that you keep falling off track? Right. So anyway, I realized that that is the central theme here, which which is keeping people from finding true healing and weight loss and food freedom on a carnivore diet. Because I think and I think a lot of your audience already knows about the carnivore diet, the benefits of the carnivore diet. They want to do it. It's just that they can't seem to be able to stick to it. And it seems like most other people that are leading the way and, and telling us about the great benefits of carnivore. It's like, yeah, I just, I heard about carnivore. I did it. I felt great. And now I'm a carnivore. It's like, but why can't I stick to it like you can? Right. And that's because the addiction conversation is missing. And I am just so happy that I'm in a position where I can bridge that gap and really kind of translate the science. And more importantly, the very specific things we need to do to rehabilitate the brain to rebuild the dopamine that was damaged by an addiction. I, yeah, while I do teach at Miami Day College, I also do coaching, group coaching, one on one coaching. My bachelor's, my master's were in nutrition and dietetics. Um, I did the whole, you know, internship to become, a, I became a licensed dietitian. And then I did my PhD at the University of Miami in exercise physiology and nutrition. And my dissertation was a span of five years diving deep into the addiction um, literature and also exercise and how exercise can be used for addiction. I, need, I know the addiction literature like the back of my hand. I mean, I had to defend it. And over time, I kept up on, you know, learning about all of the updates and everything that's coming out. Tell me a little bit about the that integral part of 
exercise and diet mm-hmm. and then the addiction. I think most people, maybe we touch on addiction first, but most people yeah. don't think they're suffering from an addiction because when I talk about my eating disorder, most people don't think they're suffering from disordered eating. And I would challenge that maybe they were never as severe as mine. But when we turn to food, I mean, maybe I'll ask you, what do you think are some signs that you may have a poor relationship or an addictive relationship with food? If you decide that your life is going to be better, if you stop eating sugar and carbs, you can lose weight easier, or you can heal a autoimmune dis- disorder, whatever reason um, you might have for why it might be beneficial to cut out carbs and sugars. If you ha- if you have that thought, and then the next thought is, oh, I'm scared, I'm anxious, I don't know what it is, but there's this hesitation, there's there you go. There's your answer right there. You know, it means that you do have that addiction. Because if I am to tell you to stop eating broccoli, you'll like stop no problem, right? It wouldn't be an issue for you because you don't care about it, you know. But if something has an addictive profile, this is where you hesitate. It's the same when people say, oh, I'm an abstainer or moderator. There's none of that. It's, it's all addiction. Because what is the definition of a moderator? Oh, they feel sad if they have to restrict or be completely abstinent. Well, that's the, that's the definition of addiction. You know, if you feel sad or just in a depressed state because you have to abstain completely from a, a toxic oh, food that, you know, that has no benefit. That is an addiction. You know, just like the abstainer, the moderator is equally as addicted. So this whole notion, like, no, you're a moderator, not it's like it's all addiction. Okay. You shouldn't have to have any negative feeling when removing a substance. Um, and if you do have that negative feeling when you remove it, then that means it's an addictive substance or behavior. I, I find it so interesting. So I've always preached about the abstainer versus moderator, but I think it's interesting because when I first started carnivore. I thought of myself as an abstainer that I'm very black or white or very extreme. And so if I just removed carbs, so in the beginning that helped, if I just don't eat the carbs, then I can do this diet well, and it worked. And then my first year I would struggle. So if I ate a keto treat, then it ended up becoming eventually full on carbs. Um, And then I would go through a binge cycle. And once I really try to adopt the abstainer, it helped a lot just mentally only to think okay, I am not a moderator. So if I just am extreme, but then over the years, what I found is as I've healed, I think I do fall more into the quote unquote moderator, meaning like I'm not really an abstainer or a moderator anymore. It's just like, yeah, I could have some carbs or not. And it's, so I don't really fall into any of it. And your logic of seeing it in the lens of an addiction, it makes sense. Maybe we temporarily, if we can just say, I am an abstainer, so therefore I won't eat sugar uh, just to eat carnivores to try it. But then then doing the hard work of, well, actually, maybe it's truly an addiction. Yeah. I, so what I've noticed is that, so I have had clients where they struggled to go sober completely and abstain, you know, completely. And so the way that they reasoned is like, okay, so then maybe I'm a moderator. I'm not, a, you know. Right, right. You know what I mean, but like the whole the whole idea that you struggled means that the addiction is there, right. you know. So something that I've noticed is that a lot of times people say mo- they're moderators because they're not having any real strong reason or negative effect from having a tiny bit of carbohydrate. It's mm-hmm. not affecting them or something addictive. It's not affecting them. So you know they can go through their lives and have a cheat meal once a week. And it's like, you know, I'm a moderator, I can have a cheat meal, I plan it, I have it the next day, I'm back, you know, and so I'm a moderator, I don't have to be an abstainer. It's just because they don't have a good reason. But if they get, let's say, um, diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, and all of a sudden, it's like, no, you have to do complete lion diet for this amount of time. All of a sudden, it's going to feel a little hard. Now, sometimes when you have a strong reason, it makes it easier. You're not thinking like it's not an option to go back, you know. Right. But um, when, when you have a good, a, a stronger reason or some some other purpose for why you want to clean up the diet even more, now you will feel it. 
But if everything is good and dandy and life is good, I have six pack ads. I can, I can, you know, schedule my cheat meal once a week, you know, so then you could look at those people and be like, oh, they're moderators. They can do it. But the addiction is still there, you know, because then you'll notice they're constantly thinking about their cheat meal. They're constantly Mm -hmm. planning their cheat meal. They're like, oh, I can't wait to have my cheat meal. You know, you, you only have those feelings when it's calling your name because it's an addictive substance also like for me when i started talking a lot about sugar addiction and working even with clients i feel like sometimes the all or nothing approach can set people back because when we feel like oh my gosh i had a protein bar and so that means i broke my sobriety and so you know there's i'm never gonna get over this thing because this thing is far more addictive than heroin i Mm -hmm. you know i stand no chance so that kind of thinking can lead to binges and so what you have to and and it just comes from just not understanding how dopamine interacts with addictive substances because if you have a if you've been if you haven't had sugar carbs or anything addictive let's say for two weeks and you have one quest bar maybe two, maybe three, whatever, you're still in a net positive gain in terms of healing the brain from the addiction, because all of this time away from addictive substances allows your brain to build its dopamine and D2 receptors, because you need both dopamine and their receptors to go up in level to reset your, you know, baseline level of dopamine back up again. And so you're still in a net positive. Yeah, sure. It would have been faster building of the brain if you didn't have those artificially sweetened, addictive keto treats, but they didn't set you that far back. So maybe they dragged your baseline level of dopamine a little bit lower, but you're still higher than where you started. Sure, sure. So, you know, I think understanding that gives people, um, empowers them to know that, no, they're actually still on the road for, uh, you know, complete food freedom eventually. As The higher you get in terms of dopamine, the more food freedom you get. Would you recommend then, if you know that there's a lot of people that don't, are not successful because they go all in first. Do you recommend that people start slower? I I don't recommend that you um, underestimate your abilities, but I do recommend that if you do have an just crazy craving, don't be too hard on yourself. You can satisfy it with slightly, you know, addictive foods while we treat the root cause of the addiction, which is that dopamine deficit, which is the brain damage, basically, or the dopamine damage inflicted by your food addiction, or honestly, by any addiction, they all work the same way. They all destroy the dopamine centers in the brain, specifically the number of the dopamine receptors called D2 receptors on, in your brain. And so this is why my approach is not so much about freaking out about the purity of the diet as much as it is about fixing the root cause Right. Of the addiction so that we're not constantly living in fears like oh my gosh I leave the house and there are ads for sugar everywhere and there's being pushed on me and it's like you're constantly living in fear it's like you can't constantly be scared of the triggers you know this is the way that it is you know of course I would love it if the world woke up and stopped pushing such highly addictive substances on us 24 seven, and especially being marketed to our children and especially being found in schools, you know, like, yeah, that I'm all for regulating addictive substances, the way we regulate heroin and the way we regulate smoking. Sure. Right. I'm all for that. But at the same time, my work with my clients is about empowering them so that I couldn't care less. Like right now, I literally bake keto cookies for my hubby because it's his cheat meal today, you know? And so like, I'm literally baking the most addictive, delicious cookies you will ever have in your life. And I'm putting them in the oven, taking them out, you know, put melting Reese's peanut butter cups on top. <laughs> you know, and then, and I, I couldn't care less, you know, because you know why? I just finished running an insane amount, but insane amount for people for me it's easy because my fitness levels up I just I maintain it very easily it's it doesn't take that much time doesn't take that much out of me anymore you know but um yeah so I don't have that dopamine deficit that I've struggled with for all my life you know okay and so no. I couldn't care less that he'll be eating cookies in front of me and watching tv I couldn't care less. I think what you share is so important because I mean if I were just talking about my own n equals one I couldn't have gone a quote unquote moderator point of view, because if I did that, I would have binged every day because every temptation of any bit of sugar or carbs would have 
eventually got me down a bad rabbit hole. So if by just going strict or going um, where I was completely abstaining, that helped. But you're right in moments where that keto treat ended up ruining the my whole journey. In my mind, I just needed to finally accept and that's where I got to eventually, but I had to accept this is just one fall, you pick yourself up and you keep going. And then I as I worked with clientele, I saw the same thing where people are like, I'm not better because I left in the onions or I'm not better because I it's because I still use garlic or it's because of the coffee I include or it's because of the diet soda. There's all these little things. I, I don't think it's just that. I think as you're mentioning, it might be the dopamine and the receptors because I know from the thousands of people we've worked with, it's not one thing that you've left in the, or that you're not perfect about that's still making you sick. And so maybe if you could share a little bit more I love that you're empowering. And so you're letting people know it is not because you're not good enough or you're not perfect enough, but rather we just need to lift this one thing that you're lacking. And then you actually have a tool for people to use. So if you can talk about why do we need dopamine? Like who cares about it? Well, you need dopamine to get out of bed in the morning, right? It's (laughs) that pleasure molecule. It's just literally waking up. You got to have something to look forward to some goal you want to accomplish it is pumped out every time you accomplish a goal it is pumped out in a pleasant social conversation or social interaction um you go out out walking you pump out dopamine it is the motivation molecule it is the anti-stress molecule the more dopamine you have the less cortisol you have you never have high dopamine high cortisol they're always against one another so if you have high cortisol it it feels as if you don't have enough dopamine because it burns through your dopamine stores and vice versa. Dopamine protects you from feeling the pain of cortisol and stress. So it is the productivity molecule. It sharpens your mind, mental clarity, gives you energy, everything. It is, uh, I always say, and um, it's, it's, I know it's, it sounds funny, but I'm being very serious. I, I always say the earth doesn't revolve around the sun. The earth revolves around dopamine. It is the central tenet upon which everything else is uh based on you know if you want to have enough uh, strength to set boundaries and say no in your relationships and avoid toxic relationships the more dopamine you have the better you are able to do to do that the more dopamine you have you have the higher your level of dominance in the social hierarchy so now people can sense other people's dopamine levels this is kind of like their um, dominance levels and so you'll know in an office setting or any social interaction you'll know who's the alpha who's the beta and who's on the spectrum you know like depending on how much dopamine levels they have and so you you would think twice before messing with somebody who very clearly has very high dopamine levels or at the gym for example you think twice before coming in and asking somebody how long they still have on this machine if they're you know if they're like an alpha you're you're gonna think twice before doing that whereas if you appear to be you know a little bit shaky on the shakier side most likely that means you're on the lower dominant scale you're more likely to be asked those things and expected to rush up so i can use the machine you know like little things here and there what i mean everything uh you make more money when you have more dopamine because it's a motivation molecule so you you can have energy for days it's like the energizer bunny keeps right, going right. you know the the difference is that unlike when you do cocaine there is a high and then there's a drop because it destroys the dopamine on a is a long-term effect there is no crash when you do it naturally when you treat the root cause of this mm-hmm. dopamine and the reason that I love exercise as the best way to bring our dopamine levels back up again and our baseline or set set point of dopamine levels back up again is because I think that it is the most powerful, most effective, most efficient way, fastest way to get you there compared to any other modality. Because, for example, meditation can raise your dopamine and D2 receptor levels. But it because anything that actually causes some pain whether physical or mental, is going to trigger higher dopamine. So, you know, if right now you are 400 pounds and the only thing you can do is walk literally a quarter of a mile, but that quarter of a mile is so difficult, that's still going to trigger more dopamine. So, you know, it's the sensation of um, pain and discomfort that triggers it. I love exercise because it's not just the mental pain that you would normally get with meditation. 
it's also physical. It's everything, you know, so it's faster. Um, but if you can only start doing that, if you're literally bed bound, you can do that, you know, and then eventually you can move a little bit and then more and then more, you know, it's the, the feeling of this comes um, that triggers an upregulation of dopamine and D2 receptors because dopamine is also an anesthetic. It anesthetizes the pain, right? And it makes you numb to feelings of uh, discomfort. This is why I can run 10 miles, no problem in like 90 minutes and I'm not dying. It's like, yeah, okay. It's just another day <laughs> because sure. I don't feel the pain. I, it feels easy because I have very high dopamine and high D2 receptor levels that numb out that pain. But somebody who's just starting out, they don't have, they haven't reset their dopamine to this higher level. So they feel like they're about to die after the first half mile. What is it about food addiction that affects your dopamine and then reduce? It sounds like it reduces your D2 receptors. Yeah. So what is that relationship? Yeah. So any addiction um, is going to reduce D2 receptor levels. Food can do that very effectively. Anything that anything that is releasing way too much dopamine mm -hmm. very quickly and very, uh, very high levels of it at once, it's like taking a hit of cocaine. When you pump out all this dopamine, and it all this dopamine attaches to the D2 receptors because you have to have that like lock and key situation. Right. The dopamine has to attach to the D2 receptors for you to actually feel the effects of dopamine. So it's like you do a line of cocaine, you have all this dopamine, it's activating all these D2 receptors, right? Dopamine is stimulating. And so you might not be hungry. That's another thing, appetite suppression, dopamine benefits. So if you're doing cocaine, you're not hungry, you're going, 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 you're spending a lot of energy, you might not even want to sleep, right? So the brain freaks out. It's like, I don't know for how long this level of stimulation is going to last. So let me prevent this <laughs> person from wasting themselves away. And let me down regulate, start destroying mm -hmm. the D2 receptors on the cell surface of adjacent brain cells or neurons. And that's what happens. So with addiction, in the initial phases, you're taking the drug because it's releasing all this dopamine, it's giving you this high, but very quickly after every high, there's a low because very quickly those D2 receptors get destroyed. So over time, you started out before the addiction with a pretty high normal level of D2 receptors. You wake up easy, no problem, you're happy, right? And then you start it, you take the first drug, you go up and then you go down. When you go down, the baseline is now lower than where it was. And then after, over time, the more hits you get, the more um, substances you consume and the more frequent, then the baseline keeps dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping. And, and now most of the time you're taking the drug not to get the high, you can't even get the high. It's just to bring you back up to normal for a short period of time. But then it keeps dragging you lower and lower and lower, you know? And so this is why if you're a heroin addict or a cocaine addict or any kind of addict, you're not really trying to get the high anymore. You just want to feel normal. You just don't want to be depressed. Right. That's why you're relapsing. That's why you can't stick to a carnivore diet or any kind of diet. That's so fascinating. I heard the same exact thing about coffee. So coffee, the initial stimulus, and then eventually you need the afternoon coffee, the evening coffee, the whatever amount of caffeine, because all you're trying to do is feel that very normal baseline you used to feel prior to ever having coffee. So it's so crazy. Yeah, they drag you lower over time away from your baseline. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. So then how does exercise? So you brought up a little bit of the pain. Why do you choose exercise in order to start increasing your dopamine? You can choose anything that's uncomfortable to you or painful to you. So if it's a cold plunge or meditation or you can be as creative as you can. Just do something hard, maybe a project, a cognitive project where you have to be focused for a certain period of time. You gotta, you can do that too. Um, as long as you force yourself to go through the pain, not like you feel, oh, okay, let me, let me open up, you know, Instagram or whatever. The moment you feel the urge, it's like when you feel the urge to get distracted, that's the pain. That's the emotional pain. You have to sit in it and force yourself to continue working on the project you know instead of going on instagram exactly okay as long as you sit through the period of discomfort that's the trigger for your brain to upregulate its d2 receptors because otherwise why would your brain spend any extra atp molecules or energy or resources or effort or time why why would it waste any of its resources to build more d2 receptors more dopamine producing right. cells why would it ever do that you got to give it a reason and the reason is ugh, I'm doing uncomfortable things. I need some anesthetic 
so that I can do those things easily without feeling any discomfort in the future, you know, and this is how things become habits, you know, and if initially, you know, anything you do for the first time is going to be hard. The second time, a little less hard and less hard, less hard, you know, because you adapt and you have more, more, more dopamine. It's like an exercise, right? And that's the goal. So I think about procrastination. So when we're doing hard things, the procrastination is the Instagram or going downstairs or going and getting a snack. But I wonder, it's like in that moment of natural hard that your body would then create more receptors. Instead, the procrastination is that freebie dopamine that actually ends up killing more of your receptors. And that's where procrastination can be super, super bad. Exactly. Okay. Fascinating. Exactly. Yeah. Or, or, or putting up, you know, Instagram and look at scrolling and scrolling and getting those dopamine hits to bring yourself back out of this dopamine that you've used up because you're being mentally focused. And it's like, you're feeling, you're feeling now the dopamine deficit state, which is why you feel the need to distract yourself. You're, it's just basically all ways of you mani- trying to manipulate your dopamine levels to go back up again. Right. And so you pick up Instagram, but now Instagram, yeah, it's going to raise your dopamine levels, but it's going to raise them so much because it's an addiction too. And so the net effect is that a little bit more D2 receptors are going to be destroyed. So do you think part of the reason why people can't stay consistent to a carnivore diet is this whole dopamine thing? And then I if th- I think it's all of it, all of okay. it. Yeah, for the most part. And, and you know, always notice the people that are very resistant to exercise, they never really can stick to it long term. Um, it's a it's a minority minority of people who just yeah, I'm going to go carnivore. It's like, and that's it. No problem. No relapse. They, you know, it's, a, it's like, I, I don't have the numbers, but they're very, very few and far in between. How do, how should, I, let's say I was brand new to carnivore. I am a unknowing sugar addict or food addict. And now I need to support my receptors by possibly bringing in exercise. How do we start? Do whatever you can okay. that is a little slightly more uncomfortable than right now. So if right now you're completely sedentary, just any kind of movement is going to be uncomfortable to you. Great. <laughs> what I would recommend is pulling up an Excel sheet, whatever method. of I, I Again, I will always recommend exercise because I just think so much quicker. It's so fast, you know. Now, unless you have serious joint pain and issues where sometimes carnivore is going to heal that eventually. And now you can train later on. But, you know, if you can't do that initially, it's fine. I have a client who just celebrated his 100 and five pound weight loss milestone in four and a half months, wow. you know, no training, whatever he can, he needs literal like knee replacement in both of his knees. So he's like, he cannot, he, I, I can't have him running 10 miles, <laughs> you know? So it works too. Just, he has a very strong reason, you know, his reason right. is, you know what? I, the reason I need knee replacement is because I, you know, gained so much weight over time. So it's like, that's it. I'm, I'm sticking to the diet this time once and for all. And he completely understands the addiction component. So he's not messing around with, with little things and slip ups here and there. But for most people, I feel like exercise is so much faster than because how, how are you going to raise the intensity of a cold plunge, right? You know, you, you get into or, or a cold shower, not everybody has cold plunges in their backyard. So, you know, a cold shower it's kind of hard. It's it's not enough stimulus. What is it, 30 seconds, one minute of discomfort, then what, you know, unless you can say, okay, if I, I literally cannot move, then okay, do it, do the cold showers. Um, but you have to increase time under tension and or intensity, ideally both. So either put it colder and colder and colder, but then that becomes a problem. I'm in Florida. It's kind of hard. You know, I do take cold showers, but I know it's a joke. It's like, come on, I'm in Florida. <laughs> You're never going to get really cold freezing water here, you know? So there is that. If you have a way to get colder and cold, colder water, fantastic. Um, and then time under that, you know, cold water. So if you start off with 10 seconds, then it should be, you know, the next day a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. I just feel like that drags on and on and on. But if that's the only thing you can do, that's still such an inspiration because once you overcome your struggle, that becomes your biggest advantage because somebody who's starting off from a worse shape and transforms their life is far more valuable to humanity and is definitely going to have a, a billion dollar brand compared to somebody who is a little overweight, lost the weight, and now they're, you know, uh, having a, who, who do you think is going to have a bigger impact, influence, a bigger brand? You know, right. so always remember that. And don't, I don't want to, 
I don't want anybody to feel disheartened. I, you know, if you can train, I feel like exercise is just such a quick way. Because if you don't, it takes two years for your brain chemistry to return back to normal. Oh, wow. Yeah. So then- that's only to go back to 95%, 90, 95% normal. It actually takes more like close to seven to 10 years for your brain chemistry to go 100% back to normal. Wow. And that's assuming that you've never like cheated or had that stimulus. Yeah. Good luck with that. Zero right, relapse right. for 10 years. <laughs> two to 10 years, you know, and where you're already in that dopamine deficit in the past. So you're, you're, let's say a food addict, right? So you already have less D2 receptors, but you don't feel the pain of the D2 def- the dopamine deficit all the time. Cause every time you feel it, you reach out for sugar, right. you reach out for your drug. So, you know, yeah, you're feeling the generally depressed, maybe or not very energetic, all that stuff, but it's not as painful as with, when you completely eliminate all sources of dopamine. Now you're operating with D2, less D2 receptors and not even any dopamine coming in to activate those D2 receptors because you stopped eating the addictive food. So it's like, let's see how long you're going to last in that depressed state before you relapse, you know? I want to ask you what specific exercise, but before I I have you answer that, I find it so fascinating because I do see in our clientele and even in the community at large that I'll see people give up their sugar, but now they're either doing something else that's addictive. So maybe they're now shopping a lot, or maybe they're doing other things that are maybe not the best way to get dopamine. And they're often, especially with my clients, it's harder for me to get them to move or do exercise or do the harder things like focus on reading a book or doing certain things that will build the dopamine naturally, because the logic is it's just easier to do the other things, right? It's easier to just keep pressing by now or other things that also end up killing your dopamine receptors that aren't necessarily ideal. So you're swapping one addiction for another, but not truly properly healing. Yeah, it's that's a, a addiction interaction disorder or aid, which is like, generally what happens when people tell you, Oh, yeah, I got sober from, you know, alcohol, but now they have a gut up until, yes. until here, you know, that's the norm. I think that what, what is it? Um, relapse rate is 90% after doing a rehab, because mm-hmm. they don't understand what's happened. They're not targeting the root cause of the addiction. They're not doing things to build the brain dopamine centers back up again. So yeah, you stop using heroin, you stop the food addiction, you stop the alcoholism, but now you still have that dopamine deficit and you're looking for other ways. You just transferred a drug gotcha. with a, to another drug. This is why when, you know, with gastric bypass surgery, right? Almost everybody who requires a gastric, I, I can't even say almost, I mean, it's everybody. Who needs a gastric bypass is a serious, severe food addict. But we completely ignore the elephant in the room and we just cut off part <laughs> of right. their gut, you know, where they're now having nutrient deficiencies for life, right? And we don't even, you know, help them with the root cause of their problem. And this is why el- rates of alcoholism following gastric bypass and addictive disorders they go up by what, like 400% in yeah, the heard next two it's years, crazy. something crazy like that. That's why <laughs> you didn't cure anything. <sighs> Not, I have a client just worked with me. I was telling you earlier, right? Um, that I have a client that I just onboarded, did a gastric bypass in 2019, lost a hundred pounds and then regained the weight back up again. And now she's only 40 pounds less than before the surgery, only 40 pounds less. She still has oh. 200 pounds or something like that to drop the addiction is still there what what, what did we accomplish with the surgery and now we have to factor in not only now do we have to focus on the food addiction and the weight loss now on top of that we also have to factor in the nutrient deficiencies because of the what what happened where we have a a large uh, part of the stomach that cannot absorb nutrients the way it used to yeah we have several clients that have done some type of altercation to their gut to hopefully lose some of the weight whether it's lap band or gastric bypass. And a lot of them struggle. They come to me saying that I need to figure out how to eat this way better. And then because they're feeling the nutrient deficiencies, but as we look deeper and deeper, it's much more than that. It's always much more than that, especially with these types of clients that we get. Yeah. And now it's a more complex case, you know, when in in the past, you know, even if you had 200 pounds, it was no problem. 
problem. We talk. We there are very specific things you got to do for addiction. You know, it's it's not that hard. It's not that simple. It's just that people are climbing the wrong mountains. And, right. And you know, it's like oh, this, it's like when you when you treat the root cause, that is when you get real lasting success. So let, let's talk about the exercise. I know that sometimes I would tell my clients if you feel the urge to binge go run down the street. And I, I used to do that. And it would help, or I would play really loud music and dance and move my body. And then a lot of times that would help. Sometimes it wouldn't, but people say, well, I don't feel like doing that. That doesn't sound fun to me to go and do. So how do we start having the exercise, start taking over some of the dopamine and not turning to the food for the quick hit? So I think when you, we empower our clients with the knowledge it becomes easier mm -hmm. to to do those behaviors that we are asking of our clients, you know? Andrew Huberman has great podcasts that I would recommend everybody check out, especially the ones where he talks a lot about dopamine because he goes deep into the physiology. Okay. So I love what you mentioned. I've done that too. Uh, and that's a good kind of like short-term band-aid you yes. know you, you, it's a great tool to use when you, when that craving hits but i would still layer that as or or, or um, that should be part of the overall long-term plan where we're raising baseline level of duty receptors you know but that's a great tip what happens is that if you're feeling uh low dopamine right you get that craving what what's the craving is basically a dopamine deficit state so you're feeling that that uh, deficiency in dopamine and you're trying to look for any way to get that dopamine and in the past you've learned that food can raise dopamine levels very quickly and that's why it's not like you care about the cookie you care about the dopamine that is going to deliver so <laughs> you're feeling a craving of dopamine is low leveraging dopamine is what what that tip that you just gave us which i think is fantastic what you do is when you do something that it's going to wipe out your dopamine even more. Something difficult like push-ups or sprinting. Anything that you hate to do even worse off, to makes you feel even worse off than what you're feeling right now, is going to drag dopamine even lower. The, the more dopamine dry goes down, the more that triggers release of more mm -hmm. dopamine and D2 receptors. Because like we said, just like, that's the whole purpose of exercise. It's a feeling of discomfort, drive your dopamine low. You know, if you want to feel like you want to kill yourself. It's like this low dopamine level, but that's the goal because it's the pain that tells the brain, this is uncomfortable, please help me out here. And so the brain starts to release more dopamine and also more D2 receptors. Okay. And so this is a great tip that if you're feeling like really down, so do something even harder, than that for five minutes well however you can last ideally a little longer than that and that's going to trigger uh an instant release of dopamine so it gets you back up a little bit and that's great like a little band-aid during that afternoon or that hit of craving so that you don't go and destroy even more dopamine right. you know in the long term by eating the addictive food um and just always remember that that's fantastic and great but keep keep working that baseline level keep getting it higher and higher do you think that lifting weights versus run doing cardiovascular exercises make a difference in terms of the dopamine? I think okay. they're both fantastic. I just find that cardio is easier because you can sustain that discomfort for a longer period of time. Whereas with the uh, weight training, there's a lot of, uh, it's all about time under tension. So if, right. if you're doing a set and then you rest for two minutes and then like, how long is your set lasting? How much is your rest lasting? So just tally up the minutes. That's all I care about, the number of minutes time under tension. And then tally up the minutes you can get under cardio. Which one can you do more of? Ideally, I want both. And that's what a lot of clients also struggle with, especially if they come to me from a complete sedentary um, past um, and they start training. It's like, oh, this is still hard for them, the training, but it's still like we you need to get their level of fitness high enough okay. for them to really feel a major shift in their mood that's constant that never goes away and sometimes you know when if you can barely do a mile like it's gonna take you a while before you can do five or six miles you know for me I feel like five or six miles is like the bare minimum per day to like guarantee a thousand percent that I'm bulletproof for that day you know that day like I mean if you if I don't train for one day or two days that's still completely fine. I'm still high, but I don't mess with it for too long. I don't let okay. too many days in a row. Momentum is fickle. You really want to be careful with that. 
how long do you have to continue doing the exercise for the dopamines to start resetting? You said about two years, but assuming I do exercise, do I, I will eventually plateau with the amount of exercise that's hard for me. So do I have to keep going harder and harder? Okay. Yeah. It, it, that's, that's what David Goggins is trying to find out. Like there are, <laughs> are limits and apparently I don't think we have any limits. So I, you know, I think you can keep raising it and raising it to very, very high level i don't think we've discovered any limits for how long we can raise it as long as you go harder you know the more intense so the, the more intense the exercise and the more the duration of the exercise both of those factors correlate with more and more d2 receptors okay. and more dopamine baseline level um so yeah uh, i don't i don't see any limits i think you can keep raising it but i guess the question is what is the minimum effective dose that I would have to dedicate for this? Uh, what I like to call right. it is a brain rehab program. What is the minimum effective dose I would have to dedicate for this brain rehab program, which is the exercise um, until my brain heals and I'm on the other side. And it could be just 90 days, you know, cause that would ensure abstinence from any addictive foods for 90 days, you know, and then you can just, you don't have to even train. I think once you remove the addictive foods and you've raised that and fixed that dopamine deficit, better hormones, um, the 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 fact that you're not destroying additional um, dopamine in your brain from those foods, all those things, better microbiome health after 90 sure. days, your microbiome has shifted. All those things kind of um, take the load and pick up the slack for dopamine production. And now they can continue continuously pump up that dopamine on a regular basis. Remember, 50% of our um, dopamine and 90% of our serotonin is secreted by our gut mi mi microbiome, right? They create that, those neurotransmitters or neuromodulators. And so, yeah, it can be as little as that. Now, I generally would recommend maintaining, let's say, let's say you train super, super hard for 90 days and then you feel, okay, I'm good. You know, I still would recommend that you kind of dose them, the exercise here and there, just to kind of bulletproof your way up until the two year mark. And then you can choose to stop completely. But why would you want to stop training? Exercise is the best anti-aging, you know, a tool in our disposal. It, the more muscle you have, the longer you're going to live. Like, right. why not? You know, all, you can get away with literally maybe like three hours uh, per week of training, both cardio and, you know, split into cardio and strength training and you're good, you know? What are your thoughts about fruit and honey on a carnivore diet? Do you think that is a individualized food or is it going to exacerbate someone's addiction to food? I am not a fan of Franken foods and inventions in the last few hundred years where we started hybridizing oh, okay. plants to increase, you know, their sugar content. Yeah. Um, I go through this exercise with my students and by going through this exercise, like I force them to watch stuff. <laughs> and I do it with my clients too. It's like mini documentaries where um, they go over the history of every single plant food from fruit to vegetable. It is insane to see like we never had even potatoes like never existed. They were like tiny, tiny little things that barely had any sugar or starch in it, you know, and it's all fibrous. Um, a cucumber was this hairy, spiky, tiny little thing. We didn't have those cucumbers. All the fruits, you know, were often bitter, even berries. A lot of right. times you would run into bitter or toxic um, fruits like that. So there's never been an, a good enough period of time for evolution to do its magic where we have eaten those foods so that we would have adapted to this food source. We know that it's the sweet taste that's the problem, right? right? And so, yeah, if you've already been sensitized to it, it doesn't take you that much to remember that drug. Now, having said that, I don't want people to live in fear either. I think if you're fixing the root cause, right, and you've built your dopamine levels back up again, you're almost, almost resistant. You might be able to have a little bit of sugar here and there, and it's not going to blow up your brain. However, it is still very, very dangerous business. And I would not recommend it at all. I would recommend just looking at those as on the spectrum of addiction, maybe there maybe grapes or apples aren't going to be as addictive as a fried Oreo. <laughs> you know, there is a spectrum, but it's not ideal. And there's nothing in them that we need 
to survive. You know, we've survived without heart disease, without cancer for millions of years, for 99.99% of our existence as a species here on earth. We didn't miss having a sugar laden apple. Can I go back to the exercise thing really quick? Is there a certain amount that you do recommend? I think you said even three days is sufficient, but is there a minimum to just start? That's to like maintain. Okay, maintain. Yeah, but it's all relative. It's very difficult for me to know exactly like a general blanket recommendation for everybody because different people have different levels of dopamine damage because somebody who's been addicted to sugar for just one year is not going to have as much of a dopamine deficit compared to somebody who's been addicted for 50 years. You know, they have far more destruction of D2 receptors. So the person who has a larger dopamine deficit needs a little bit more time to get there, right? A little bit more. The, the, here's the thing. It's like you would say, okay, he would need more exercise, right? To build that dopamine deficit. But at the same time, those are the people who can't exercise the most because right. the more addiction you have, usually the you know heavier you've weighed, the more um, joint issues you have or things like that. So it's it's almost like a, like a U-shaped curve. I say you're 400 pounds and severe food addiction. I would start off with anything you can do because maybe you know walking two miles feels like a triathlon. That's great. It's so uncomfortable. You're really increasing dopamine levels back from, from where you were. If that this was your baseline D2 receptor level or baseline dopamine activity was here, and you can just walk two miles, even though it might seem like, oh, you're barely making any progress, that's just not true. Because if it feels that hard, it's it's that sensation of pain and discomfort that's going to exponentially increase how much D2 receptors you're going to make. So your dopamine was here, you start doing two miles, let's say, or one mile or half a mile, whatever it is that you can start. That's going to raise your dopamine level up, right? Then as you continue with the rehab program, so you're doing a little bit more walking or a little bit more intense walking, faster walking. Now the dopamine is going up and up. As the dopamine is going up, you're also getting healthier. Your joints are not hurting as much. You can train even harder, harder, harder. Dopamine goes up, 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 you know? And so it's like, yeah then you're up here now i guess i guess the curve is the exercise this this uh inverted u-shaped curve so we started with a little bit of exercise and then we rev revved up the exercise and then we can taper down because now then just to maintain you don't need that much to maintain eventually right so it sounds like it's doing as much hard as you can which then kind of makes me think about you know, in the card of our space one, there has been a lot of comments about, oh, you don't need to exercise and everything will be fixed. So I'm glad that you're talking about this and just not only just fix, but it is really hard to stay perfect on a diet if you don't fix everything else in your life. So I think it's really important that you're talking about this addiction thing, because there are a lot of people that it is really hard to stick to this way of eating, even if they are quote unquote moderators, they're just they can't stick to it long term. And then there's a lot of people that also believe that you can eat all the meat you want. um, Because if you have an addiction to food, and maybe you're not eating sugar. So now you're eating a ton of cheese or a ton of meats, and you're just grazing through the day of all the different meats you want, and you're not losing weight. And so people will say, but people say, you can't gain weight on carnivore. And so you talk a little bit about that. Can you share your thoughts? Yeah. First, I want to say that I'm, you know, I respect everybody in the carnivore space. So you know, I, I, I know that when certain people say that as a recommendation, it's because it's worked for them. It right, right. It works in people. Some people, it works for them, right? So um, not, a, not we're not all like exactly the same. And for some people, all they need to do is just, you know, start eating ribeyes and they can do it and they lose the weight and everything is fine and dandy. But I think that the vast majority of the population is actually struggling with an addiction. The vast majority of the people have lost their natural hunger signals and all of the stuff that you would need to use to just eat meat and listen to your body. They, they don't know what, how much is enough. They actually, the more weight you gain, you, you lose hunger completely. It's like you're not eating for hunger. You're, you're never really hungry. You're just eating because it's time to eat. That's all. Because of the, you know, you just have more leptin and suppressing your appetite to a much larger degree and so yeah i'm sure it has worked for some people um you know and so that's fantastic and if that's you you're so lucky congratulations i'm very happy for you right that has not been my experience 
and that has not been the experience of the vast majority of people who reach out to me. Now, you could argue, oh, I attract people who are similar to me, right? And you could make that argument, but then I would say, well, the vast majority of the population is overweight or obese, right? It's like 35, most states now, it's like, not most states, mostly southern states have around like 35% obesity rates. And now in September, once the CDC obesity prevalence maps come up, it probably going to reach the 40s, right? right. Every year is going higher and higher. So 35% obese, and then an additional 30 to 35% overweight, that's 70% right there of food addiction, staring you nakedly in the eye. And then the right. remainder, the 30%, just because somebody struggles to put on subcutaneous body fat, because there are certain physiological chain, the physio physiological differences, whereby some people literally cannot put on body fat, it just doesn't go there. Right. Um, doesn't, they're not equally as addicted. So we don't know how many of those people are addicted. You know, you have to go through, give them some questionnaires and ask them questions and symptoms to see. Everyone's yeah. addicted. When we have new clients, we always ask questionnaires and we always say that we're not weight loss people. We're in for chronically ill, trying to heal and get to root cause. But in every, almost every single person that works with us, one of their main goals is still weight loss. So I, I agree with you. And all of these people have been mostly carnivore meat based. So it is very common to see that people do not lose weight, just eating carnivore. I do think men tend to be able to follow that a little bit more, not everybody again, but uh, they tend to be able to do that a little bit more and get away with it. So this is something that um, I've noticed, well, I've, I've always knew that to be true. But after working with clients, it's even more evidence that weight loss is actually one of the single fastest way to heal. Mm -hmm. And this is what people a lot of times don't understand. They think like, oh, I, I have to eat more calories, I have to eat all the fat, because the only way I'm going to heal faster if I give my body more calories, more nutrition, right. more nutrients. Fat cells are inflammatory organs. They're right. like this inflammation pumping engine that never stops working. Every extra fat cell, even let's say you're shredded and then you gain one extra pound of body fat beyond your needs for survival and health. This extra pound of body fat that's not supposed to be there, even though it's very little extra body fat, it has increased your inflammation load. Every right. extra fat cell in your body on your frame is constantly releasing inflammatory chemicals and molecules that are not supposed to be there. And what are they doing? They're messing up your hormonal function. So it doesn't matter what your hormone labs are saying, how are they actually working? And you have those inflammatory markers, they're not gonna be working. I don't care how high or how low or you know how perfect the lab results look. So the inflammatory markers are going to mess up your hormones. They're going to mess up your dopamine sensation. Your dopamine is not going to function the same way. They're going to mess up every cellular function in your body. And so with for healing to happen, weight loss is a prerequisite. And so it's not about eating more calories and forcing yourself, force feeding yourself, you know, butter and things like that in order to get enough. Like that's not the way to go. I had a client who's, uh, I don't know if I ever mentioned her to you, but she was in, she's in Canada and for the, and she has a daughter and for the last seven years, she has exhausted all her options to grow her family. Couldn't get pregnant again. Saw all the doctors, multiple IVF rounds, thousands of dollars spent and, you know, all of everything mm -hmm. you have to go through never worked. And she worked with me for just one month. She just got a package which where I saw her four sessions in one month. And I put her on a lion diet because she was approaching 40. So we didn't have the luxury of being doing a relaxed carnivore diet. It was like, listen, if you really want the highest guarantee of success, you gotta do it perfectly. And she did, not even coffee. She just did lion diet, but at the same time, she was overweight, not even like obese, but just overweight. And I was like, you know, weight loss is crucial. And so she started training, losing, losing weight and sticking to the diet. And I get an email like it's been I think I think it's been like a month and a half now that since I got her email and she she just wanted to let me know that she's six weeks pregnant. That is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Because you got to remove it's like um, 
the inflammation is like putting on the brakes. It's like, right, it's right. like putting on the brakes for everything in your body. You got to remove that inflammation. It is very important to not have any extra fat cell on our frame. So how would you get somebody that maybe is a little overweight and do you put them on a diet regimen or like a certain macro reg- regimen then to yeah. yeah, it's very rare for people who are overweight to just go carnivore and lose weight. Like people wildly, wildly underestimate the amount of calories found in foods, even right. like things like st- even, you know, carnivore foods, and they wildly overestimate how many calories they're actually burning if they're working out. You know, so it's oftentimes simple math that we do right. to start triggering consistent weight loss. You know, um, most of my clients, when they come to me, I'm usually never the first option because I'm the one who is talking about training hard, counting your calories, all that stuff. They all like to try like eat all you can, like 30 day right. challenge or whatever, you know, and then they balloon up and it's like, it didn't work for me. And then they reach out to me, you know. So, yeah, so which is good because now at least they have that um, evidence in their life sure. that they need to track, you know, I don't have to convince them of how important, at least initially, you know, eventually you'll know, like, I don't recommend dairy, especially also for weight loss. Initially, some people might need, they're very attached to cheese and I, I'd rather them have cheese than have cupcakes, you know, in the first few weeks or a couple of months. Eventually, though, I, I start pestering them to take that off. And so it'd be the, the tracking is even more important when you're adding addictive foods like cheese, you know, it's so easy to override your natural hunger signals. Then you're just eating just to have that, that casein which turns into casomorphin, which activates the opioid receptors in your brain. Like you just want those opioids in your brain, which is why you want that cheese, you know? Like if you if you have a caloric goal and um, you kind of use up some of that allowance for lunch, yeah, it's, yeah, here's, here's what I have recommended in the past for a similar situation. Focus more on the weekly caloric goal as okay. opposed to the daily caloric goal, because it's okay if one day you're at maintenance or even a, a little bit overshooting with your calories, you naturally will most likely the next day feel a little bit more satiated. And if you don't feel as satiated the next day, maybe just try for one day leaner cuts of protein. Don't do, don't do ribeyes the next day, just do leaner cuts of protein for one day. And then you're back on track to hit that weekly floor goal easily. Yeah, I think the part that's hard is that everyone's metabolic resting metabolic rate is slightly different. So if someone has been a chronic dieter their whole lives or eating really bad foods, their metabolic rate could be like 1200. And so then eating to stay normal amount, they're going to gain weight. So that's where I struggle. And maybe that's where fasting comes in. But then if they're messed up in hormones or thyroid function, it's like, how do you ask at a ton of fasting. I mean, they could do intermittent, but sometimes for those types of people, it's not enough to move the needle. And then if someone's metabolic rate at rest is like 18, then no problem. They can totally eat. And so that's where I see people then recommend reverse dieting so that you can then increase your calories, but I don't always see that work either. So it's just this, I think for me, it just became the training because how do we boost thyroid function exercise actually boosts thyroid function unlike what you have heard also okay. in the past that actually boosts your hormonal function all of it not just your thyroid right and then weightlifting mm. puts on and putting on healthy muscle also raises your metabolic rate and then reverse dieting in a way where you start off with lean protein also raises that back up again when you apply things, it oftentimes is so different than what we read and what we see right. on paper. It's like on paper, this should make sense, you know, but or or you should be losing weight or at least maintaining weight. Like is that this is what I think your maintenance calories are. But in real life, you're not losing weight or you're gaining weight. Like, you know, when you put everything we're talking about into practice and who does it better than the bodybuilders, but I like the bikini just because it's a more natural, there's no steroids involved. It's like an extra variable that is affecting what they're doing. The way they do things is so wildly different than what, you know, the people with the textbooks are saying, Mm -hmm. you know, but application is usually always the answer. Apply it, see how it works, fix it, and then apply it again. So that, that that's where I go to a lot for for answers, especially with body composition issues. When the 
big butter fad was coming in. I don't even know if it's past now, but uh, we were seeing our clientele's thyroid markers, the antibodies go up and they were starting to gain weight. Triglycerides were going up because I think there was just too much fat or energy in the blood. And we just saw very clearly that we see the trends come when people come work with us. And it's just interesting, but it wasn't working for the vast majority of the people working with us. And it was very interesting. Yeah, I, I filmed a video on that not that long ago talking about like, stop eating sick. Um, so many of my clients, that's how they gain weight. And that's why right. eventually they come to me. It's like, I did the, you know, 30 day carnivore challenge and I ate six of butter and then you gain 20 pounds in a month. Right. I had a client who gained 40 pounds in two months. It's like, and she's tall, you know, but still that's an insane yeah. amount of weight. I don't think people realize what it actually takes to peel that off. Older people, they have a much harder time putting on muscle, retaining muscle, right? Sarcopenia is a, right. you know, the age related muscle decline. And so I would much rather focus on having more muscle mass as opposed to a focus on the fasting element, because we know that there's such a strong correlation between how much muscle mass you have and how long you're going to live, you know? Mm -hmm. And we measure that with grip strength. Grip strength is a good overall measure of overall uh, amount of uh, muscle that you have on your frame. It's like an, it's, it correlates very well with how much muscle you have on your frame. And so the stronger your grip strength, the longer you're going to live. So why not just focus on training hard and right. putting more nutrition in, you know, and eating more? Because when you train more, you can eat more and now you have more access to more nutrition, right? So yeah, we have to do hard things. And it's not like just this diet alone, will fix everything in our lives. And so if we're dealing with addiction, we need to address it. And I love that you bring so much realism to the conversation. And I think it makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I think um, when you're ready, this will hit different this topic, because I did my dissertation on addiction five years, you know, and then I had to defend it. And I had to write it up and all this stuff. And so I knew how addictive sugar not just sugar, the sweet taste is. So even artificial sweeteners, mm -hmm. same effect. They're far more addictive, right, than cocaine. And then we learned, studies showed they're even far more addictive than heroin. So I knew it in my mind, but I wasn't ready for the message. And so I think most people are living in denial because the moment you accept it, it means now what? <laughs> now it means I, I can't dabble with my drug, which means pain. And people run the hell away from pain, right? They, yeah. They'll do anything to be as far away from pain as possible. And you'll very, I mean, everybody just examine your life, all your life. You've, you've ran away from discomfort and pain. And what has that led to over time? Just degradation of your life circumstances from career to mindset to everything. Your, your, your body starts breaking down, right? And that's because you're constantly ran away from doing the work. And it, and this is why a lot of times it's, th this is why like for me, it's just the people that come to me, they're ready. They're ready. They're like, you know what? That's it. I am sick and tired. Just constantly trying different diets and, and trying different things. Um, because what I really need to do is deploy the discipline. What I really, really need to do is do the hard thing, but it's just so uncomfortable that I'm just running away from it. Eventually it's going to catch up with you. And eventually at some point you're going to say enough is enough perfectionism is the enemy of progress. And I think you can tackle different elements of your life at different rates. Maybe just focus on the weight loss first. Then we can clean it up. Like maybe, you know, you can share the fact that, you know, like it's not even controversial to say that aspartame is, is, is a carcinogen. But if you feel like you need that diet coke for the first month until you are keto adapted, then okay. But then, you know, it's probably not the best thing to right. keep because it's just this trigger that's constantly in the background, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I'll drink uh, flavored sparkling water and I was doing the 75 hard challenge and I stopped all of it because I I, otherwise, how am I going to drink the gallon of water if I'm drinking all these other things? And I noticed a difference in my hunger as well as just my overall energy, my skin. And maybe it was yeah. also because I was moving 90 minutes a day too. So that could have been it. But I noticed, I mean, granted, it is way too much water than I should be drinking, but I noticed a difference in 
just maybe even appetite suppression. But see, now I don't know if that was the exercise part of it, because I did move, I did exercise for 90 minutes a day. But the water part, I did notice that I didn't want any sparkling waters, I didn't need any of that. And yeah, I just felt I could go longer. It was it was a really interesting um, challenge I, I did. And it was the exercise. Um, mm-hmm. Now the sparkling water, was it flavored? Yeah, it was. So there would be like, um, I sometimes I drink I forgot the name of the brand, but it has a little bit of, there's like one gram of sugar or sometimes once in a while I'll drink like the element has um, that fake sweetener in it. And sometimes I would drink that. Yeah. I stopped drinking all of it. This is so great that you bring that up. So even somebody like you who has to be an abstainer, you can still have some artificial sweeteners, Mm -hmm. which is not ideal, but you're still, you still have food freedom, you know? And I think it's important for, us to share that because then people can kind of like take a, a a breather and be like you know because we try to put our best foot forward always right. we try not to bring up the fact that last week i had a diet soda or whatever because like what's the point of bringing that up mostly i'm doing well you know we try to really put our best foot forward and sometimes that can do more harm than good I think for our right. clients and for our audience because they think we're so much more perfect than what we are mm-hmm. and then that means they're always falling short and then sure. they're very hard on themselves you know and so it's really important I think um that we understand like yes yes artificial sweeteners are far more addictive than heroin we don't want to have them in our regular meal plan but you can still achieve food freedom just by decreasing the dose and ideally abstaining. And it, de- it depends on how much you can handle too. You know, it depends on your life circumstance, it depends if you're trained or not, because if you're training and you've reset that dopamine deficit, you're going to be far more resilient to addictive substances, even if you happen to have one every once in a while. Sean Baker is, has cake. On, ber- on birthday parties for his children no problem and you know and and he's he kind of also he's not immune to the sugar addiction then maybe he didn't struggle with it the way you and i have but you know he used to have a lot of that the the donuts and stuff he'll start couldn't stop just like this is what happens when you get your hands on a donut yeah so, i yeah. i, I t- i'm totally on the same page with you about being more transparent it's a fine balance because so i am i openly share that i'm not 100 percent carnivore anymore because i feel that i have healed enough that i don't need to be i do have food freedom where basically i can eat anything and granted i don't eat certain like i don't eat a lot of gluten or anything because it just doesn't make me feel well but generally speaking i can literally eat anything and not be as triggered and i think it's just because it's been six plus years of really strengthening myself right and so that's why Technically, I'm not a carnivore anymore then, right? If I go by these definitions, but I share that only for people to understand that I have had my healing journey. And now this is where I am that before I would try to dabble. Can I eat a little bit of keto sweets and will it make me binge? Because before even drinking a diet soda or a sugar-free gum would cause me to binge when I first started. And then the healing sign to me was, oh my gosh, I can eat a piece of gum and I'm not eating two packs of gum because of that. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes binging. So now I could have a piece of gum and it's fine. And so then I dabbled in, well, can I eat a little bit of keto ice cream? And then I could, and then eventually I tried like a spoon of regular, like Haagen-Dazs and I was fine. And it's just, I, that pull is not there for me anymore. And I don't know what magic is, has happened over the years, but, and I'm, (laughs) and I'm open about it because I don't want people to think, no, I am um, headstrong, all meat all day long because I'm not anymore. And it is mostly 95% meat, but I can have certain things because I can have it. It's a choice. But if I need to be sharp or I need to be highly fixated on writing a book or having that dopamine, I am hardcore, much more ketogenic carnivore because I know I feel my best and I'm performing my best. So I totally understand you there. But the fine line is if I'm openly sharing, I'm drinking a diet soda or having a cupcake, which I don't eat cupcakes, but people might think, well, if Judy can eat that and look this way or feel this way, then I can probably too, when they're day one of carnivore. And that is such a different place. I, I was at. Yeah. You're a lot more sensitive initially. I agree with you 100%. So here's what happens. The longer it's been since you've engaged in a substance, the more naturally your dopamine receptors go back up again. 
there is no longer a good reason for why your brain has to keep destroying those D2 receptors anymore gotcha. because you're not over flooding, you know, the brain with dopamine. So now it goes back to the set point. It goes back to what a normal D2 receptor level should be for a healthy brain. And so the, the, the long, this is why I said like it takes two years for normal right. brain chemistry to go back to normal. Yeah. Now, if you've, if you've dabbled in those two years, if you weren't 100% sober, but you had a few things here and there. Okay, it'll take two years and a half, fine, mm -hmm. or whatever the case may be. You know what I mean? Um, but the, just time away from an addictive behavior or substance will naturally also reset D2 receptors. So there you go. So now you've reset them. You don't have a dopamine deficit gap. And so you don't have a vulnerability to fall prey for an addictive food anymore. And I understand how hard it is because when I first started and if I had a piece of gum, I remember the immense anxiety I started feeling or the, sh it, it was, I literally remember it was diet sodas. And every time I had it, I would rationalize, okay, it's just a diet soda. It's not going to affect my sugar. And so I would have it. And then I'm like pacing and that anxiety of like, oh, just a little more. And then I want the, the real sugar. And it was, I had to cut it fully and that helped yeah. me in that time. But then I wanted to see, am I really healed from my eating disorder? And I needed to see, because I challenged my clients to do hard things. So then I wanted to see if I could too. And now I don't feel that even if I have like a small spoon of ice cream with my kids. And I was honestly scared to do that because I was like, what if it triggers me to go down a bench, but I'll have it. And it's so sweet. And it's like, oh, it tastes good. But I don't, there's like no emotion of like, eh. and then I, I just, whereas before, if they're trying something new, they'd always ask me have a bite. And I'm like, I can't, I can't. And now I can have a small bite of whatever they're trying. And then I just move on. It's like no big deal. And knowing the freedom I have now, which I never had, I, I was in a dark depression of an eating disorder and knowing how much even I have healed that if you want to call me a quote unquote moderator or what I would have defined as a moderator before right. our conversation, right. I am now healing. And I know that anyone can get here, but it was a lot of hard work to get here. It absolutely was. But I, I know that it's possible. And now you've shown the mechanisms of why that happens. I love, I love so much what you just said. I, I love the hope that it gives, I know everybody that is listening. And also that is kind of hope for me as well, you know, because then I feel, because I, I'm still in the tr terrified stage, <laughs> you know, where it's like, I'm not messing it gets around. Better. I don't even want to say, yeah, you know, I, like the cookies. Yeah, I don't care about them. But just because I don't care doesn't mean I'm going to take a bite just for no sure. reason. You know, for sure. I'm still very, very like careful. It's like you hurt me. <laughs> I mean, we need We need some space, you know. Right. And I don't eat yeah. a lot of stuff. I don't. So right. at, at my kids school parties, they'll have a bunch of cake and cookies. It's not like I eat them at all. I don't at all. But if my kids are like, mom, try this and that we're at home or we're at a restaurant, I'll try it because, or sometimes if they, let's say they're eating a French fry and I'll say, no, I don't, I don't like fries. So I don't eat it. So it's most times I'll still say no, but I know now that I have freedom in the sense of if I really wanted to, I could, but I am, it is truly a freedom where I'm choosing to say no rather than I'm scared. And so I'm saying no, and that's the freedom I really want people to get to. And so, yeah. In your case with the keto cookies, I probably wouldn't eat it because one, I already know how it tastes and how it feels. But if I had like one, I could probably stop assuming it's not just sitting. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. So, yeah. It'll always be a journey, especially with junk food. I think it's not like once you heal, you could then go back to it. That's not the goal is to heal and then regulate by eating it. I mean, there's a lot of foods I just don't eat ever, but it's getting to the freedom of not feeling that level of anxiety when you're around junk food or when someone yeah. uh, shares a picture and then they freak out because now they are sensitized to want to eat that junk food. Like you, we need to get over that or we will never fully have healing. That's what exactly. I believe. Exactly. If you're constantly living, being afraid of triggers or, or like you can't even open up Facebook and see, uh, you know, a picture of a beautiful cake that Facebook decided you should see, right, <laughs> you right. know, that's, you're not, you're not doing the right thing. And this is why, again, circling back, I love exercise so much, because it speeds up the process of resiliency sure. and empowerment, very quickly on the same day, like, 
if you can muster up five miles, six miles on your first day, obviously I'm assuming you're, you've had some experience before to be able to do that just because you decided, because if you're 400 pounds, that's not going to happen, you know? And we talked about that approach before. I always feel like I have to justify because like sometimes I'm reading the comments and they get so upset and like, what do you mean? You know, like walking isn't enough. You know, people don't want to be told to, that they have to do something harder than that. You, you go from where you are right now and you walk, it's going to feel uncomfortable. That walk is going to bump you up in your baseline. I mean, how amazing is that? And now, and now by the next few days, you can walk even longer or faster, which means faster bumping up, you mm. know? And it's like, it's, you're in complete control. How motivating, how empowering is that? Thank you so much for your time. Where can people find you and um, social media, website, YouTube? Thank you so much for inviting me. I always have a blast um, coming over here and talking with you, Judy. So thanks. Thank you again. You can find me on Instagram at Dr. with an H. Zaldivar, or my YouTube channel, which you can see here, my name, Dr. Sarah Zaldivar. Um, it's very easy to find me. There is no other person in the world with my name who's also <laughs> a doctor, so that's easy. <laughs> and then uh, my website, DrSarahZaldivar.com. Then I do group coaching, which is becoming so popular. I do also one-on-one -on -one coaching, but the group coaching thing I'm very excited about and we're growing. And right now we're doing Sundays at 9 a.m. Eastern and Thursdays at um, 2 p.m. Eastern. And it's $49 if you want to do one weekly session. So overall, so you get four sessions a month. And it's $99 if you want to do both sessions. Okay. Um, and eventually time slots are going to open up. Well, thank you so much again for joining me. And it's always been a pleasure. And I love this. I am going to share more and more about dopamine. So thank you. Yay. Thank you so much, Judy. And thank you everybody for sticking with us till the end. Okay, guys, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. I hope you realize the importance of eating a meat based diet, but also having grace for yourself. And then also knowing that it's not about perfection. It is also so important to do hard things and whether it's exercising or doing other things that may not have as much of a dopamine kick, but allows you to start healing your dopamine receptors so that you can start ultimately healing and stopping the addictions that are in your life. Okay, guys, make sure to eat a lot of meat, take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you later. Bye guys.